All right, Balancers, today's guest is a visionary mentor for ambitious women who are seeking to transform their lives and embody their highest potential. With her expert training as a behavioral change specialist, quantum healing hypnosis facilitator, CBT practitioner, and Reiki healer, she's uniquely equipped to guide her clients on a journey of personal growth and self-discovery. She's here today to inspire us all and empower us to design lives that are authentic, meaningful, and fulfilling through the transformative practices, which we'll be chatting a little bit about today, including subconscious reprogramming, mindfulness, behavior change, and quantum healing. There is so much in that, and I can't wait to dive into it all. Helen Denham, a warm welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Erica. Nice job getting through that kind of mouthful. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> well, that's a, it's this, that's, there's so many, I guess, qualifications and things that you've got under your belt. I'd love to know how you kind of fell into doing the work you're doing at the moment. Totally. Well, I, we were just talking about before we hopped on record that you love recording your podcast and it comes out of like curiosity and passion. And the same thing happened for me as I started to dive into this healing work. I just started to get really curious about my own internal experience. I think from a young age, well, I know from a young age, I really struggled with depression, eating disorders, everything, which I think a lot, most young women do. And I hit this point where I was like, okay, I am in the driver's seat. And if I don't want to feel this way anymore, I believe that there is a way out. So I just started to study alternative tools and methods to medicine, essentially. And as I got deeper into this journey of more of like self-reliance and going inward, I uncovered all of these hidden gems. And to this day, you know, there's still so much that I'm excited about studying and learning, but it was more of a personal healing journey for me at the beginning. And then it came to a point where I felt like it was time to start sharing it um, and in a, in a bigger way. So I started my podcast like four years ago in, and then when COVID hit, I was like, okay, I have this time to start studying basically and put myself back into school in so many ways. So that led to studying a lot of energy work, which I was most curious about. Um, and I was most curious about that because I had done some beautiful plant medicine journeys that had led me to understand that we are so much more than just these physical bodies and even these minds and that we are interconnected to all living things. And I wanted to be able to feel that tangibly. And I also wanted to understand the science behind what goes on on a conscious level for as much as we can understand. So when I started to put together like the energy work and the scientific studies behind it, I realized that it's all kind of speaking the same language. It's not so separate. All of this kind of quote unquote woo woo stuff is really kind <laughs> of the language of science in a lot of ways yeah. as we get further into it. So that's a little blurb about why I started to study all this. And uh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's really powerful. I love that you kind of pulled together the energetic and then like what you were learning about maybe a bit of neurology or just like how the brain works in general, piecing that together and realizing like it really all is all one in the same, just kind of versed a bit differently. It kind of reminds me when you think about things that maybe your grandparents used to say to you growing up or like, you know, fables in religion and now the science is kind of coming out and proving it. it, it it's kind of nice when things all, all marry together. But one thing that I particularly am very interested in, it's something I've done a bit of a deep dive into myself in my own journey through therapy. And that is this idea of subconscious reprogramming. So I guess for people very briefly, you have, or at least as I understand it, you've got your conscious mind. So things that you can you know, see, think, and feel, you understand their thoughts in your mind. The subconscious is a little bit more difficult. It's a little bit obscured. It's not something you have direct access to, but through different, you know, techniques and, and even just telltale signs, you can tap into what's actually going on down there. Now in the subconscious, that's where our limiting beliefs sit. So beliefs that hold us back, beliefs that maybe contradict with things we consciously want and feel. And I feel like this topic in particular for women, especially whether it be in the workforce or just in general in their lives is something that can be so debilitating. So I wanted to know kind of in your experience, whether personal or through working with women, what do you come across as the most common limiting beliefs? Oh, hundred percent. It's I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. I'm not good enough for this. I'm a disappointment. I don't deserve this. I have to work hard to deserve this, or I have to change myself in some way to be worthy and deserving of love. To be honest, that's what it comes down to because people will come in and they'll say, uh, you know, I want to make 10 X my income, or I want to do this. And they're like, Oh, I just need to change my daily habits. I'm like, 
okay, <laughs> let's get way down to it because it's really like they don't believe that they're worthy and deserving of the life that they have or the one that they desire. So they'll self-sabotage. And I've been right there. So it really comes down to unraveling those belief systems that were built really young. You know, the subconscious mm -hmm. primarily forms those like core beliefs, like zero to seven, like really young. That's why our trauma stays pretty prominent. And we all have trauma, whether it's with a capital T or a lowercase t going into our teenage and adult life. So it's really about getting in there and saying, okay, what beliefs have stacked here to lead you to believe this about yourself and to develop this kind of personality. And then the beauty mm -hmm. of mentorship or meditation or therapy or anything like that is that you're held in a safe container to start exploring those spaces. Because I think when we're alone, sometimes it can feel very debilitating when we get triggered or something comes up that makes us deeply sad or scared. And especially when we don't really have the tools straight up available to us, it can be scary. Mm -hmm. So that's why I love this work and providing these containers is because people feel safe to bring it up and then transmute it, work through it, alchemize yeah. it, and literally rewrite a new story, which is absolutely possible. So it's very, it's hopeful work and it's, it's very real what happens. Yeah. And it's, it's so profound when you think about it, that you have this thought or belief that you internalize and hold on to as truth. And then you realize that you can literally rewrite it and, and move beyond it. It doesn't need to hold you back anymore. And I firsthand have also seen the benefits of, of doing that deep dive work uh, with a therapist. That's kind of my safe container. But I guess just for anybody listening, because even though I've done the work and I want to be very transparent about this, it doesn't mean I'd never think that thought again. So for example, my limiting belief is that of not being good enough. And that came from when I was very young, how I was raised, how I received feedback. I think all of us fall in the same basket with school. The way you're kind of praised and, and seen to be progressing is through uh, praise. And, and when you kind of grow up and you don't get that because nobody has time to praise you 24 seven, you, you have this then secondary belief or it taps into maybe what you weren't getting when you were younger. But long story short, you know, that that's something that I've now processed and understood where it's come from. I've done the origin work. I've done the deep dive. But I still, as I move forward in life and experience new things and have new, you know, journeys or change, for example, that thought still presents itself for me. So for people listening, uh, and let's talk maybe beyond or outside of the experience where you need that safe container and you need that additional support, kind of momentarily when that thought comes up. What's a really practical tip in your opinion to process, deal with, kind of work through that thought as it comes up, provided it's not something we need that safe haven for? Yeah. First of all, I love that you're acknowledging that like this work is kind of never ending and that's a beautiful thing. That's okay. It's not like there's this end goal. That's why we call it a practice. I'm a confidence mentor and I still have days regularly where I'm like, oh shit, that comment really hurt my feelings or like, am I good enough for this? But the difference now is when we use these tools, which I'll mention in just a moment, we get to close the gap faster you know, we get mm. to close that gap of like sitting in that suffering state of stuckness, basically, where we're like, you know, unraveling and triggered and all these things. And maybe we stay there for a week. But with this work, we get it down to like a second, you can acknowledge mm. it, you bring conscious awareness to the suffering and you say, okay, I'm going to breathe. That's okay. So the tools that I go to, the one that has really changed my life is EFT, which is emotional freedom technique. It's literally tapping on certain points of your face. Uh, people often compare it to acupuncture. It can be referred to as psychological acupressure. Um, and mm -hmm. as we tap on different points of the face, we're speaking through positive self-talk and also acknowledging the darker thoughts, giving you know light to that, moving through it, and then implanting kind of that new story and that new belief while we tap on the face. There's something very somatic and the mix of physical touch and tapping and speaking like talk therapy in a way is extremely powerful. So I teach EFT and, uh, but one of my favorite teachers is Brad Yates on YouTube. He's got all these amazing free videos. He's been like the OG. He was actually the first interview I ever did on my podcast. So I love Brad, Brad Yates, uh, <laughs> EFT has changed my life. It's absolutely amazing. So that, and then a very simple tool, which I think we all know, you know, as kids, when we're upset, we're throwing our tantrums, our parents say, take a deep breath. 
there's a reason they said that because when we're when we're breathing heavily and our heart rate is up and we're in the state of panic, our whole nervous system is getting the message that we're unsafe and we need to run. So mm-hmm. literally, if we just can get into that awareness to just take a breath and just calm down, our nervous system will come back online and we'll feel safer. And from that place of safety, we can start to change as well. So it's not that these things don't come up. It's like when they come up, how do we bring loving awareness to it and start to move through it with more compassion and not beat ourselves up more for even having experienced it in the first place? Yeah. I love that you frame that in a way that you never, uh, like getting better at it is not that it disappears as kind of I said, but it's that the response time shortens and you, you're the quickness in which you bring that awareness to it it is almost instant. To be honest, I feel like the more you practice, the more you kind of just start to acknowledge and accept as opposed to maybe resist or just get stuck in there. So I love that. And, And really, I think ultimately at a high level, the techniques that work for everybody is whatever brings them back to you know, parasympathetic, just calm, kind of relaxed state. Because if you've ever tried to change or tell yourself you're okay, or just sit and meditate when you're in a state of angst or like frustration, it's often quite difficult, which is why I think some of these techniques are really powerful. And uh, EFT is something I've heard about. I have, I think I tried it for like two days and then I just, I I don't think I learned how to do it properly. So I'm going to check out Brad Yates because you're not the first person to have mentioned it. And I think like I'm very much open to experimenting with different techniques. So essentially, and just to clarify, I would be using that technique in a moment where I may be getting stuck on a a limiting belief. And I would be talk therapy in the, in the phrase of like an opposite affirmation while I'm doing the tapping or what's, what's kind Mm. of the language you recommend using? Totally. So I've got a couple like one minute reels on my Instagram page too. So if you want a quickie, you can go over there, but literally I'll walk you through it. So like I'd be tapping on my face like this and I'd say, you know, even though I feel ashamed right now, I still deeply and completely love, honor, and accept myself. Even though this is really scary right now, I trust that I can move through this. I trust that I'm going to feel better today and I'm choosing to do so. So it's literally like that. And and your guide will walk you through it. So you're literally just repeating after whoever's walking you through it. And then as you get used to it, you can do it on your own as well. But yeah, that's it's so easy. It's literally, there's no learning curve at all. You're just, it's Simon Says. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Well, I'll pop your uh, Instagram handle in the show notes too, so everyone can check that out. But Brad Yates, also another good resource. Um, I want to ask you something now that I feel like is maybe not spoken about a lot, but something I think is really, really important. And it's knowing the difference between when we're actually blocking ourselves from our potential versus when something is not aligned for us. So if we're currently coming up against some barriers, how do we know that that barrier is not our limiting belief and maybe it's actually, you know, misalignment, if that makes sense? This is where I think we need to start practicing discernment really well and getting to know ourselves and our preferences really well. Because when you know what actually lights you up and you lean into your authenticity and you understand like this brings me life force energy, you're going to start to be able to tell intuitively if it's for you or not at a much higher rate. Because I think when we get stuck in those positions um, and we're guessing, the guessing should already be a red flag. Like if we're Mm -hmm. guessing at all, it's like that should already tell you that something's a little bit off. And I also like to ask myself, you know, is this me speaking or is this someone else in my mind? Is it a societal programming speaking? Is it somebody I just saw on TikTok that I want to be like? Is this my parents in my head? And then kind of, you know, really get honest. Like, is this what I want or is this what someone else is telling me that I want? And I Mm. always, I love to do this kind of trick. Like I ask myself on a scale of aliveness, how alive does this make me feel on a scale of one to 10? (laughs) If it makes me feel like a one and I'm constricted, like, you know, that's very clear that I don't want to be moving in that direction. But if I feel more alive when I think about moving towards something, that's like a heaven's yes. So, I mean, and you can start practicing discernment in really small ways. Like ask yourself, do I want like pizza tonight or a salad tonight? Or do I want to go out to the movies or do I want to go, you know, here with my friends and start to feel into your authentic gut yes response 
And then that will come into play when you're making bigger decisions as well. But it's about training your gut and mm. internal knowing and your discernment so that it's your voice and you're authentically speaking. Yeah, I love that because so many times we can get so raveled in the expectations of our parents, of our friends, of society, you know, what we quote unquote should be doing. And when you're stuck there, you're basically being governed and your life is being determined by others. So of course, it's going to be difficult to hear yourself in that place. So I love the suggestion of starting practicing discernment and like connecting with your intuition, essentially in those smaller bite sizes. So I can guarantee for anyone listening, if you've ever been in a restaurant and you have like two things that you're not sure what you want, right? And you say to your partner or your friend, you're like, I don't care. Like you pick what you want. And then they always say something and you have that like, oh, I actually wish they picked the other one. That's your intuition. So for people who are like, I don't know if I feel it or it, sometimes it feels off, like it, it actually is there. But if you lean into what other people want, sometimes it, it actually doesn't serve you right because it's you're just pushing it onto other people so i love that you broke it down into the practice of discernment and again i love that we're talking about this in terms of a practice because it's not a skill so to speak that you obtain and it's like check i've done it i feel like as you grow and change in life like you need a different level of it it kind of needs to grow with you so you know those those few techniques have been really useful and and i think just in general this chat about getting to know your intuition to bolster that is really key. And, you know, utilizing all of that to kind of work out if the barrier in front of you is your limiting belief or actually misalignment is, you know, that's the best way to do it. And I love that you kind of said, if you have to question it in the first place, that's probably a very good sign in and of itself. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you have anything to kind of add to this chat on discernment and intuition just before I ask you the next thing? Oh, no, I think you just gave a great example. Another little trick that I like to use is I'll literally flip a coin if I'm unsure about something. Or I love to pull like tarot cards and oracle cards and have so much fun playing in those realms as well. But if I get a reading from that that I don't resonate with, that's my internal compass as well saying this isn't for me. I don't agree with that message or, you yeah. know, so I love that. It's a great tip to use in real life too. Mm hmm. Yeah. Actually, one thing that's just come to mind for me personally, when I feel a little bit out of balance, a little bit out of whack, you know, we all have those weeks where I feel like I'm just very scattered mentally. I don't feel kind of aligned. And so what, what do you do or what, what do you kind of walk your clients through when they need to get a little bit of clarity in whatever it is? Maybe it's something specific with work. Maybe it's a particular decision. Just in general, they need to get that clarity of mind. What's the best way you've found to achieve that? My first answer is go to nature, unplug, leave your phone at home and go on a walk in nature. There's something about the fresh air, the biome, the, the clarity, the peace that you feel in the woods, or if you're not near the woods, just somewhere where you can connect with nature. Um, and it's just always come the beach back for me. Yourself. Yeah, the beach. Exactly. And I think being near water is very clarifying in itself for our whole system. And just allow yourself to think. And I really talk to myself. Like I will literally put um, the voice notes on in my phone and I'll record myself moving through whatever's coming up, whatever blocks. Like I'll just literally say in my phone, like I'm feeling stuck on this and da da da. And usually I'll work it out. Um, this is also why I love to take road trips. So if I'm driving down to New York City or something, I will just do that in the car. Like I'll just talk it out in the car. And then of course, journaling, really getting those feelings out on paper and I think sometimes we underestimate the power of journaling to actually see your thoughts and feelings out on a page, not only moves any stuckness or suffering or pain out of the body to another space, like to actually release it, it gives us a much clearer picture of what's actually going on so that we can approach something from a more logical standpoint in so many ways. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's really about getting yourself in a sanctuary to move through those thoughts and actually brainstorm, giving yourself a tool also for purging it and getting it out onto the paper and then make a plan, you know, think about what the best case scenario would look like. So if you're feeling stuck in career, for example, and you're like, I want to be here, figure out what the best case scenario would look like and, and make like a five step plan for actually getting there. That's attainable within two months. I don't like to really make like year long trajectory plans or anything. I feel like when we give ourselves a certain amount of time, it usually will take that long. And I always remember Elon Musk saying this about his team. He was like, if I give them 
two weeks to do something, it'll take them two weeks. If I give them two days, it'll take them two days. Like with, with focus, we can get so much done. So I actually encourage people to be like, okay, how can you actually make this change maybe faster than you even think and not procrastinate? Like we can get so much done with clarity and with focus and with a plan than, than sometimes mm-hmm. we think we can. Yeah. And, and I love that idea as well. I kind of subscribe to not planning too far ahead because in the last two years, I've had such a radical shift in my life, which has really changed where my quote unquote five year plan from five years ago would have thought I'd be today. And it's not necessarily in a bad way. I just think as humans, and I know for a fact this applies to everyone listening, if you're growing and changing, you almost can't anticipate like what future you as as 10 time grown version of who you are now is going to want, need or desire at that point in time. And so of course, like you can have your, your high level goals and aspirations, but to, to tie yourself down to something that you may not actually want in the future or may actually crystallize in a little bit of a different way. I've recently found quite hard to do. Like I was quite an avid manifester before. And now it's like, I use that as a tool for more short-term things because things could look so different this time next year. I'm very much open to life being fluid rather than being more fixed as it was when I, you know, before I moved overseas and before I became a little bit more open with work. So, so that's just, I guess, a little note from me on in agreeing with you on, on the concept of planning too far ahead. Totally. And yeah, I think manifestation is honestly, when you boil it down, it's just clarity. It's like, what do you want? And I think that's mm-hmm. the number one thing usually that we underestimate needing to get clear on like, what do you actually want? A lot of people don't know what they want. You know, I have so many clients come in and I'll be like, what is your ideal? What's your heaven on earth look like? What's your ideal day in the life look like? And it's, they don't know. <laughs> so a lot of the work is to like, get clear on what we actually want. And that's usually like what the vision board is for, for me. And just like you, I'm constantly updating that because our wants and desires absolutely change. And that's, that's wonderful. So I think the clarity really is what the manifestation key is, key is around. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Definitely agree there. Let's um, shift the conversation. I'd love to know a little bit more about the concept of quantum healing. It's actually the first time I've come across it. So I'd love for you to share a little bit about uh, what it is and how the listeners can utilize it daily to help them with their progress and growth. Totally. Quantum healing. Okay. This is where we're working with the energy fields. We're not, we're, we're moving beyond the body. We're moving beyond the thinking mind and we're working with our spirit, our, our highest self and bringing in guidance from other energetic realms as well. I studied under Dolores Cannon who has passed recently, but she has a, a, you know, quantum healing kind of school that I went through. So if anyone's curious about Dolores Cannon, she, she's just a beautiful teacher in this realm. But quantum healing, to start with the basics here, if if we've all meditated, we can think about how we kind of start to like, when we're in a good meditation, we kind of start to hover a little bit and we get in, we tap into the conscious awareness. We kind of leave the thinking mind or we can at least consciously observe the thinking mind and the body, but we're kind of like floaty. If you've had a lucid dream, if you've been in the astral realms in that way, if you've had deja vu or moments where you feel like, whoa, I can feel the energy changing here. We're kind of working in that realm and the astral realm that is in the energy in the energy field. There's also this energy um, segment on Gwyneth Paltrow's series called The Goop Lab. I think it's like episode four or five or something with John Amaral. And he does a great like literal example of this where he's working with people. He taps in, he brings it in physically. So he works with energetic realms and then he taps into people's vagus nerves to channel the energy and it physically moves them and physically helps them purge. So it's interesting to put words to energetic work because there are hardly words for it quite yet. It kind of reminds me of, you know, astronauts trying to explain what it feels like to look down on Earth from orbit. And they don't really have words for it yet because it's not a universally experienced sensation. Um, So we're still developing language around how to describe what goes on here. But in a quantum healing session, we are going into the subconscious but we're going like another layer in. We're going into the soul's path and the soul's journey and our dharma and what our, I'm getting kind of chills thinking about this, like what our life path is and unraveling that and also inviting in guidance from spirit, guidance from our ancestors, cleansing and protecting our auric field. So we're working more in the subtle energy fields. And it's really beautiful how our emotions will let us know 
how it's going. So for example, if I'm working with someone and we're doing a quantum healing session, I'll usually take them into a deep hypnosis so so that the body is fully relaxed so that we can leave the body kind of behind to rest and recharge. Then we'll also leave the mind behind as we deeply relax the mind. And then we'll start to invite in the highest self or like the oversoul kind of sounds darker, but I do, I do bring them into kind of channeling this highest self and opening up the crown chakra, which is our connection to spirit, our connection to, you know, the energetic realms, bring that in and, and let that part of self and that part of soul speak. And then we go on an internal journey of what needs to come up. And it's amazing how the guidance will come in naturally. So when I have done it, I've been on the receiving of, end of this. My buddy Leo took me through a journey and it's it's like you're dreaming almost. Your soul and your spirit will show you what you need to see. So he brought me down into these quantum realms as we would call it. And I ended up like shape-shifting. This is now we're getting into this trippy realm, but I ended up like shape-shifting <laughs> into this Merlin character, this masculine, like magical energy that had come through like childhood books that had really stuck out with me my whole life, like this fascination with magic and creation and these, you know, little sparks of life that are undescribable and explainable. So I was walking through this black forest in Germany as this Merlin character, and I made my way to this castle. And I also have this love for like castles and royalty and beauty and opulence. And one of my self-limiting beliefs that I've been working through with so many of my healers is unblocking wealth codes and allowing myself to experience prosperity. So the castle in this quantum healing session was blocked. So in the healing session, we were able to kind of release the walls of this castle. And you're kind of in a trance when you're in these states. So I was speaking to Leo and I was saying, I'm now I'm at this castle and I can't seem to get in. So and this is say, visual for you. Like you're, you're Very visualizing visual. this. It's all very visual, I find. Eyes yeah, closed, absolutely. eyes open. Eyes closed. Yep, eyes closed. You're definitely in trance. Like you're in this mm -hmm. hypnosis state. So it's like a deep, deep meditation. And you can tell when someone's in it because their voice will start to change. And they go into this kind of monotone kind of like just they ch they're channeling basically they're channeling spirit their own spirit that's crazy their own source code it's wild so anyways that you will go on a journey that's most necessary for you it's it's very similar to like a past life regression but i don't love to call it a past life regression because we're not in time and space so much in these realms we're getting we're getting to see parts of our spiritual experience that need to come up but through that mm -hmm. it's healing because for example those wealth codes were able to be broken down and i was able to say this is where i'm blocked here these are my deepest fears here and you kind of get to shape shift into these different experiences to have these releases so i know this is all very like out there but hopefully this is kind of making sense but it's like a deep subconscious meditation meditation visualization journey where you don't know what's going to get revealed, but what comes up is most necessary for your healing process. Yeah, no, I really, I really enjoyed learning about this stuff because when you realize how detached we are from the subconscious every day, you understand what is required to tap into that. And so this stuff doesn't actually seem so far fetched when you understand like kind of what you need to drop into it. But this is all yeah. super fascinating to me. Um, and so when we're talking about quantum healing, it's essentially something you would do with somebody that guides you. And so now, even though you've done a session, it wouldn't be like you have tools and tips, like little techniques that you can access on a daily basis. You would need to do that in like kind of a controlled session. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, it really helps to have someone guide you and prompt you to ask you questions as you go through it, to be like, okay, Helen, what are you seeing there? Why is that coming up? Okay, keep going. What's next? And some new visualization will come up. Okay, what's next? What is this showing you? How does this make you feel? It's really nice to have someone guide you through that because otherwise, so you can play with quantum healing on your own for sure. One of my early experiences with this was through practicing astral projection and lucid dreaming, which, um, I've, heard about this. I've only done it a couple times. I'd love to dive into it again. It just takes practice um, where you practice meditation, but right before you sleep, you learn to, to have your consciousness leave the body and you can kind of hover above your body. And this led me into a huge fascination with people that go into a coma or have near death experiences where they're literally on the operating table. They leave their body. They can see the room. There's so many accounts of this. And the university of Virginia, I believe has a huge donor who has been like sponsoring their research around near death experiences that has given us so much valuable 
content. There's also a great Netflix series called Life After Death. But for anyone interested in quantum healing and this, it's all connected. It's all about the consciousness existing in the body and how we can explore the conscious self and have that come into our human experience. So you can explore that through studying near-death experiences, studying astral projection, going into the dream world and studying dream work. And a very simple way that I've been able to activate lucid dreaming is just throughout the day asking yourself, am I dreaming? And looking at your hands, like ask yourself in this moment, am I dreaming looking at your hands? Because that will start to train you to do it in a dream. So in a dream, mm. at some point, you'll look at your hand and you'll say, am I dreaming? And it'll look weird. And you'll be like, oh my God. And you'll have a conscious awakening in the dream. And so I think dream work is a really great place to start with quantum healing, meditation. And then you can go deeper into these journeys where you're guided and prompted in a much easier way. Because if we are totally blocked to this, it's more difficult to release and go into it. Like if I were to do a quantum healing session with a guy, you know, in, in the financial district in FIDI who does, who's never meditated in his life, he's not going to necessarily be so open to it. He might, he mm -hmm. might like, he might crack open, but it, to start to like massage this basically and open it up is really helpful so that you can have the deepest experience possible. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is so, so interesting. My interest is highly peaked at the moment. <laughs> it's with, um, with lucid dreaming, quick question before we wrap up, is that when you are in a dream and then you're conscious that you're dreaming and so you can kind of control the dream? Because I feel like that happens to me. It's only probably happened a handful of times, but I've like, for example, been on like the edge of a very tall building and then I've consciously been like, well, you're just dreaming, say what it feels like type thing. And like kind of push myself to jump off, like to, to see if I could fly or something, something like that. Is that kind of what lucid dreaming is? Yeah. And that's a really common dream to have. Like when you're flying, does you, it have a meaning? People, um, I think it's freedom. Like you experience freedom. Like you could jump off a building and you, and you would fly and you can, mm. I, I've had those dreams a lot. It's that it's flying and it's sex. It's like our two basic like human <laughs> needs. Like we just want to experience the highest pleasure, like flying, sex, like amazing experiences, all these things. So those are the common lucid dreams, but you're exactly right. It's like when you become conscious that you're dreaming, sometimes it only lasts for a few seconds. And it's not so much like what's that movie inception or something where they, they really control the dreams. It's not like you're not controlling it on that level, but you certainly know that you're dreaming and you can you can change your environment with that awareness and be like, okay, I want to go this way. Um, or I want to mm -hmm. do this. And it's like, you feel like, like you're playing this, a game or something. <laughs> yeah. But it's almost like this misty environment. I'm trying to explain it. Like, even if I wanted to like run in a dream or move or punch something, like it's like a heavy, have you ever had a dream where you can't punch something yeah. or you can't, you it's feel like, like stuck, like a like almost. Yeah. So yes. It kind of feels like that in a lucid dream. Like you can control it to a certain extent, but it's more just about the awareness that you're dreaming and having so much fun in that space. And the best time to trigger that is taking a nap during the day because your, your body and your brain are like, I'm not supposed to be sleeping right now. So it's a lot mm -hmm. easier for you to become consciously aware in the dream when you're not exactly exhausted, but you could fall asleep. Um, so that's been a, a fun tool to use for lucid dreaming. Mm -hmm. So, so interesting. I'm sure you uh, have a lot of resources on your Instagram. So I'm going to pop links to it in the show notes. Is there anywhere, anywhere else that the listeners can connect with you to stay up to date with information like this and just in general, what you're up to? Totally. Thank you so much. Um, so I also have the podcast called the lifted podcast episodes drop every Wednesday, sometimes Sundays too, a couple times a week. And we're having very similar conversations over there, just like this one, talking about consciousness, spiritual evolution, self-mastery, confidence. I'm a confidence and business mentor. So I really focus on self-esteem a lot and using these spiritual tools to boost our esteem. But yeah, that and Instagram at Helen Denham underscore on Instagram. And that's basically it. That's that's my uh, that's my home base. Amazing. Well, I will pop links to all of that below. Listeners, if there's anything that's uh, popped out in today's conversation that you want to hear more of, we actually didn't get to go into the confidence side too much. We really got stuck more on the spiritual subconscious conversation. But if anything or the confidence stuff is stuff you want to hear, uh, drop me a note on Spotify. There's a little Q&A section on the episode. But, Helen, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show today. I've learned a lot and uh, I look forward to connecting continuing to connect with you and following along your journey as well. So thank you. Thank you so much, Erica. You're a fantastic interviewer. I loved chatting with you. Thank you so much for, for having me. It was a pleasure.